welcome everyone this morning. If you're a guest with us today, we're so glad to have you in service with us today. Pray that the presence of the Lord touch your life today. You're joining us online this morning. Welcome you as a part of this service. Trust and believe that the same God that is here is the same God that is where you are. Amen. Praise God. Mark chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading with verse 16. And for my own self consciousness sake, if you weren't here Thursday night and haven't heard, I had a close encounter with the electric hedge trimmers. So that's, that's what's wrong with my finger. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't we just take another moment and worship the Lord as He continues working and moving in this place. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee and the he that it's speaking of is Jesus. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Some of the other translations says they were commercial fishermen. This was their livelihood. They weren't just out um, for a hobby. This is this is what they did for their living. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. I want to draw your attention back to verse number 17 and the words of Jesus. He says, Come ye after me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. I want to preach to you on this subject this morning. The potential to become. The potential to become. Father, thank you for your presence in this place today. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping and exalting, lifting up the name that is above Every name. Lord, yesterday and really all throughout this week and today, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people that are really, in essence, worshiping, praising human beings for accomplishments of hitting a ball, catching a ball, throwing a ball. But Lord, we praise you because you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We praise you because you're the almighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We praise you because you've never lost a battle and you're never going to lose a battle. We praise you because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We praise you because you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. We praise you because all things work together for good and so God if they can do it for men who are humans that fail we can do it for you that never fails 
We praise you today and we thank you for the opportunity of being in your presence, Lord. Lord, those that gather in stadiums or sit in living rooms and watch games, they, they may experience the excitement of seeing what somebody else does, but we experience today firsthand the power of your touch your work, your spirit in our lives, Lord. And I pray that you would continue that in this service. Touch hearts and lives in this place today. Lord, I pray that faith would connect with every individual. Lord, I I believe faith has already been released in this atmosphere through our praise. But let us as individuals mix your word with faith today that it might profit us. I trust you and depend on you today, Lord. Trust you for your anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. I believe that you could summarize Jesus' time on this earth. That there was there was essentially two primary purposes of why he came. The reason why God manifested Himself in the flesh. I'm not sure if one is more important than the other. In fact, I think in a lot of ways they're, they're just all connected. But, but I believe that the two primary reasons Jesus came was, first of all, to provide salvation. Thousands of animals had been sacrificed and those sacrifices were not sufficient to provide forgiveness of sin. And so the Lamb of God came and was sacrificed on the cross. And now because of that you and I have access to being forgiven, to having our sins washed away, to to becoming a new creature in Christ Jesus. The second purpose that I believe the reason Jesus came to this earth was to establish the church. Not a church, the church. I know we put brands on the church. I know we put names on the church. But, but the church, not a church. And, and he said to his disciples that he was going to build his church. He also promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And I tell you today, I don't care what opposition there is in this world to the church, whether it is spiritual opposition or natural opposition that we face, the church will be victorious. You can't shut down the church, you can't stop the church, you can't outlaw the church. There's always going to be a church. And truthfully, the church thrives the most in the times in which there are the biggest challenges and adversities. If you read the book of Acts, the church didn't start at a time and the church didn't get off the ground when everything was optimal. From the very beginning, the church faced opposition, persecution, and yet it grew by multitudes. So Jesus came to establish the church and build His church, His body. You you would think that, especially considering the fact that He he was only going to be here just a couple of years doing that. He lived around 33 years and 30 of those years is... There's not a whole lot that we know about. There's not a whole lot that the Scripture talks about. There's not a whole lot that He does that's recorded. The the primary thing that we know about before 30 is His birth and, and this one time that He and His family made a trip to the temple and, and they leave and they don't realize that He's not there and they go three days without Him and it obviously was a much different world than it is today. If you're a parent out in public, you usually don't go three seconds without making sure you still know where your children are. But they go three days and realize Jesus is not with them. And so they make their way back and finally find Him at the temple right where they left Him. So those are really the only two main things that we know 
the, the Bible tells us, gives a little bit of insight as to what was going on in those 30 years. It says that he was learning obedience through the things that he suffered. So at 30 years, he, he kind of shows up on the scene publicly and that basically starts with John's baptism of Jesus and John's declaration when he says, this is the one that I've been telling you about and this is the one I've been preparing the way for. This is the, this is the Messiah. This is the one you've been looking for. And so in the course of just the next three years, a part of Jesus' focus is establishing a foundation. He, he's not going to have 50, 60 years. Bishop and Mother Wright came to Annapolis in 1970 to start this church. And, and, and now we're three congregations. And there's, there's three leaders of those congregations. And, 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 but, but Bishop is now 78. He's still around. He's still overseeing. He, he's still helping to provide some guidance and direction. But, but Jesus only had three years in the flesh. So you would think that, even if he had more than that, you would think it, but especially if he only had three years, you, you would think he would, have, um, he would have gone on Indeed, and isn't it Indeed where you can post resumes, I think? You, you would have think he would have gone on Indeed and perused resumes for hours and hours to, to find the most qualified of candidates, the the ones that had the most education, the, the most degrees attached to their name. You, you think you would have thought he would have found some men who had, you know, were, were very religiously established and, and, and very well respected. But he, he goes down to the shore by the lake and he finds what, I think we would refer to today as blue-collar workers. He, he doesn't go to the synagogue where the religious are, where the, the educated are, the religiously educated are. He, he doesn't go to where the well-respected religious people are to, to pick out those that are going to be a foundation for the, for the greatest thing that's ever been built in the history of mankind, the church. He goes and finds some, some fishermen. There's a really good chance that they probably were not real clean cut. We had, my wife's probably not going to be happy with me for using this, but oh well. We, 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 we had hosted James's first birthday party in our in our backyard yesterday, and I kind of noticed a few moms. <laughs> She's wagging her head over there. I, I kind of noticed a few moms checking their kids' diapers. And, and then I kind of noticed, I think it was a dad or two that I noticed this part. They were like telling other dads, hey, you, you might want to check your, your kid's diaper. And I, I realized what was going on, and I chimed in. I said, hey, it's nobody's diapers. It's our drain fields over there for our septic. The prime location where our picnic table is and seating area is has this wonderful aroma that usually sweeps through when you're trying to, to relax. Supposedly, it's all in order. If you have any solutions, I would love to know them because I would love to enjoy my backyard more. I, I'm pretty sure these guys smelled a little fishy. No pun intended. I, I'm, they, they probably had some, some fish guts on their robes. They, they, they were not the most attractive of individuals. And Jesus stops by and starts with four fishermen. And he says to those first two, follow me and, and I will make you 
to become fishers of men. In essence, what he was saying was, if, if you will follow me, I will turn you into something far bigger and greater than anything that is imaginable for you. You, you are expecting just to live out your days fishing, surviving. But I've got something much bigger that I want to do through your life than you just simply being fishers of men. I, 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 I think it may be more than one person, but it's okay if it's only one person. But I feel like I've come to preach to somebody today and tell you if you will just truly surrender your life to Jesus and do like these disciples did and decide to follow Him, that there are some things that God has for you in your future that you would have never dreamed to be possible. There are plans that God has for your life that it's not based on what it looks like where you are what the outcome should be but if he can take two fishermen four fishermen and from those four fishermen something 2,000 plus years later is still going strong then he can take you with whatever your weaknesses are whatever your struggles have been and he can make you to become something much much greater than you think is possible. Is there anybody here that, and I know we have, you know, sometimes as kids we have those, you know, crazy dreams of what we want to be when we grow up that the older we get, they, they really don't stick. You know, we, we kind of move on to something else. There, is there anybody that, that you've had some you had some things you dreamed of becoming. You, you really wanted to be or do, and, and they, they never just never happened. Any, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why, why didn't you become that? Chances are there was, there was obstacles and difficulties and challenges it's a common thing for any any kid that plays sports any boy that ever plays on the playground basketball court or plays football in the street or pick up baseball somewhere it, it's just almost a given that you began having dreams of playing in the pros That's one of those things that a lot of times it, it kind of wears off and goes away the older you get. And, but, but sometimes it doesn't go away. You, you don't achieve it because you, you need some abilities. You, you need some coordination. Depending on the sport, you need some size. I... Growing up into my, probably into at least my mid-twenties, basketball was my favorite sport. The older I started getting and the less I could keep up with the younger guys, I decided to find other things to play where I still had a chance of winning. That's probably why there's so many old people that love pickleball. But I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was a decent basketball player. But I, I never got past 5'9". And I don't want to offend anybody with saying this. You've got to be so careful nowadays what you say and whatever. So if you're woke, you need to go back to sleep. <laughs> but I, I'm 5'9". I'm Do you see the color of my skin? I'm that color of men that can't jump. Muggsy Bogues and Spud Webb, height wasn't really an issue. They jumped and they made it to the NBA, not me. I've never been tall and I've never been fast. Usually guys my height are at least kind of fast. I never 
It didn't really matter if I wanted it. I, I, I wasn't good. I guess if you are exceptional, you can, you can be not tall enough and still do it. Do you know that I, I looked this up? I've heard some statistics before, but I looked this up again just this morning. These are, these are some statistics I found from, from 2023. In, in football, there are, there are over 73 between all colleges, so not just the top college, not just, what is, what is the in double A division, what, what's the top? Division one, yeah. All colleges, all, all levels. There's over 73,000 football players between all colleges. Anybody want to take a guess at what percentage of those will pay, play in the NFL? 1.6%. Men's basketball, there's over 18,000 participants. 1.2% will play in the NBA. Women's basketball, there's over 16,000 percent of participants. 0.8% will ever play pro. Baseball has over 36,000 participants. It's got the highest percentage of those that will play pro, 9.9%. The highest percentage of college athletes of any sport that will ever play pro is less than 10%. You know how many millions, probably billions, of dollars are spent by parents from the earliest of ages with dreams that their kid's going to be the next Jordan, the next Tiger Woods, the next Tom Brady, the next LeBron James. And there is less than a 10% chance. I don't know how many of you, we, we don't put him on the spot all the time, but I don't know how many of you know, we've, we've got one of those 1.6 percenters here, actually. <laughs> Brother, Brother David Upchurch is... One of the ones in that 1.6% played in the NFL. But le less than, how many, how many friends of yours growing up played ball and dream, had the same dreams as you? <laughs> it takes more than a, a wish. It takes more than a dream. It, 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 it takes some things you have no control of. I promise you, if... If, there, if it was possible to, to impact your height by thinking about it, there is one person I know of in the world that it would have worked for. I'm sort of embarrassed at 52 years old to tell you this now, but I, there were times I actually bargained with God. I made promises with God that if you would let me grow and Become at least 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, I, I made promises. That's how obsessed I I mean, my dad's 6'1". My little brother is 6'5". My, how old Noah, 10? My 12-year-old my nephew is eye to eye with me now. But you know what? My, my wife touched on it. We, we are so ready and willing to thank God for answered prayers. And, and I've heard others say it, but I just saw it on somebody posted something, a meme or something on social media a couple of days ago. But, but you know what? Not only should we be thankful for answered prayers, we ought to be thankful for some unanswered prayers. Because some of the things you're upset with God over for not answering, if He would have answered them the way you prayed them, you'd be lost. My, my dad, I don't know why I'm on this. This is really totally unexpected and I'm being very... 
transparent with you, which I try to do anyway, but anyway. My, my dad told me years, I was probably in my mid-20s by this point. He said, I got a word for you, son. God gave me something. Okay. I don't know why all the words everybody has for me is stuff I don't want to hear. <laughs> I don't know why the answers I always get are the ones I'm not looking for. That's not why I... I made the mistake, Brother Brother Vernell comes in every Sunday morning, checks on me, asks me if I need anything. And I made the mistake of asking his opinion about something this morning. <laughs> because I was pretty certain, I, I asked it because I, I was pretty sure he was going to be on my side. <laughs> he wasn't. I said, I said to him as we were walking out of my office, I said, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> Which isn't that the way we choose friends? It's the people that tell us all the only what we want to hear. And if you tell us what we don't want to hear, you're not my friend. I said it very jokingly because the truth of the matter is that's what a true friend does. They'll tell you what you don't want to hear. My dad said, Son, my the Lord, the Lord gave me a word for you. The reason why you never grew as much as you did is because if you would have, it would cost you your soul. Because you'd have been so given to sports, you'd have been lost. Okay. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you that you didn't answer my prayer. We, we could go on and on. Sports is just kind of the, the easy one. How many, how many people go to New York or go to Hollywood with dreams of making it big? How, how many people go to Nashville with dreams of becoming the next great music star in, in whatever industry? And, and it, it just it never pans out. And some end up living out lives on the street of, of brokenness and addiction because they, they wanted to become something and it, and it just never happened for, for whatever reasons. But can I tell you something today? There is one place in this world that you can be certain that when you give yourself to it, when you respond to the invitation, you can be certain that there's something you can become. There is something of worth and value that will come from your life that is bigger and greater than anything you could have ever imagined. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55 and verse 1, Ho, oh, stop, wait, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. What he's, what he's saying is there are no obstacles to keep you from this. There, there are no challenges that you cannot overcome if God can take four fishermen. And, and then after that he goes and finds an aisle. RS agent. I mean, I can sort of see using fishermen, but you're going to go get an IRS agent? You're going to invite him to be uh, people that take my money that I want to keep? I don't know if they can be saved, Lord. But, but he, he takes the unlikely. He, he takes, I, 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 I heard it years ago and a while back I looked it up and was able to find it. But there's a, somebody did a, they, they did this, they did this write up where it was uh, Jesus was, was sent off to this company that does, you know, evaluations and, and of, of potential employees and 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 so he sends him sends off and and they write back and they give this summary and and they go through 11 of the disciples and and they say why each one is not qualified it uses you know some personality traits and terms that we use today and and it goes through this whole list of the 11 and and says why all 11 of them are not qualified to to be his disciples to be the ones he uses and then it gets to Judas and it says, but this one, this one right here is the one. 
You definitely want Judas to be a part of what you're doing. The only one that it didn't go very well with is the one the world would have recommended. All of the ones that were disqualified from a a human perspective were all the ones that in the end he called and used to begin this church. Can I can I tell somebody this morning that the world has told you you're disqualified for for whatever reasons. You you're not you don't have what it takes for whatever reasons. I've come to tell you today there is a God that is inviting you who is saying if you will follow me, I can make you to become. You can start from Genesis chapter One almost, not quite, but you can start from the beginning of the Bible, I'll say it that way, and you can find example after example after example of people that had the potential to become something, not based on who they were, where they were, what their education was, but simply because they received an invitation and they responded to that invitation. There's just this average ordinary guy by the name of Abram that that this God that few people really know about at this point says, hey, I I want you to leave your home. I I want you to pack up and leave behind your your, your surroundings that you're comfortable with, your family. And and if you will follow me, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I mean, if you're telling a a, a 20-year-old that, okay. You're about to do something great through a 20-year-old that's got all of his life ahead of him. All right. But you're going to tell a 75-year-old man that has no kids. I want you to leave everything behind because I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And it's also not going to be another 25 years after that before I kind of really start doing it, but... And yet today, he's known as the father of all believers. It's not the firstborn of of, uh, Jacob's. It's not the firstborn of Jacob's that God calls to, to use for deliverance of his family and provision in a time of famine. It's it's the youngest the next to the youngest that that God gives the dream to and God begins to use for the fulfillment of, 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 of not just taking care of the family, but something even bigger than that. It's, a, it's, the, it's the youngest of his family who is... Can you imagine if somebody shows up to your house and tells your dad, where's all your kids? I need all your kids here. I, I'm here on a mission. A mission from God. Where, bring all your sons into this house. And they, they bring seven sons. Right? Dave was the eighth, right? They, they, the, Jesse has eight Sons. He has eight sons. But when when the prophet shows up and asks for his sons, they they bring seven sons and they leave the eight out taking care of the sheep. You, you ever been left out of some kind of family thing? You, you ever found out your family was doing something without you and for some reason they failed to tell you? Even if it wasn't really intentional. <laughs> Ooh, man. <laughs> he, Samuel... Samuel lines those seven sons up and he goes down through each one of them and every one of them, God says, nope, nope. Well, I must have messed up. Let's do this again. Let's start over. One, two, nope, three, seven, nope. Jesse, do you? 
do you have any more kids? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there's one more, but surely. Brother Burnell Spriggs has done a life course many times now. If you're a guy and you've never taken it, the next time it comes up, you need to do what you can to take. It's called Wild at Heart. The premise of the book is that every, every man res- receives a wound at some point in his life, and, and most of the time that wound comes from, the, from their father. And it's not just about bad fathers, even good fathers. And, and there's something, there's a, there's a vote, I'm going to kind of oversimplify it, but, but there is a, there's, there's a vote of confidence that basically every, every male is looking for from his dad. That was the opposite of a vote of confidence. Yeah, I got one more, but I can't get him. Okay. Imagine walking in to the house, and everybody's there, and you start to realize, you know what? Y'all have been here a little while. I'm I'm not the first one to this party. I don't know how much was said. I I don't know how much he gathered from what was going on, but we we find out a a little bit later when 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 uh, David has been tending those sheep again, that that his father sends him to where his the rest of his brothers are in this standoff with Israel and the Philistines, and 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 David shows up there, and they say, "What what are you doing here?" According to the scripture, they didn't just say, hey, who's taking care of the sheep? They they didn't just say, who's taking care of the sheep? That would have been okay. They 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 kind of they they added an insult and who's taking care of the few sheep? What are you doing here? You you've got some unimportant job back home and and from that boy from that boy who knew firsthand what rejection was he he knew firsthand what it mean meant to be overlooked from from that boy comes some of the most amazing verses in your bible one of, if not the, well, the most well-known chapter in the whole Bible comes from that boy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I don't know if He's your shepherd. I may get overlooked by everybody else, but the Lord is my shepherd, I, I shall not want. Uh, goodness and mercy are following me. It's, it's from that shepherd boy. That we get the man after God's own heart. Uh, nobody else saw the potential of what David could become. No, nobody else saw. You know, it's, it's interesting because Saul, King Saul, the Bible says of King Saul that he was head and shoulders above everyone else. He, he, you know, if, you, if it was somebody you were going to pick to be king, Saul was the guy you'd pick. And it didn't take long for Saul to shipwreck. <laughs> but it's this, it's this 17 or so year old kid who gets anointed to become king that becomes the greatest king in the history of Israel. Children of Israel come back to the Jordan River after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And Joshua sends spies into the promised land to scout it out. Moses sent 12. Ten had a negative report. Only two had a good report. I don't know. I think maybe that's why Joshua decided to. I just want two spies. These two guys go in. Somehow they end up 
hiding out in the house of Rahab, a harlot. A woman with not so good of a reputation. There were probably some other more upstanding people in Jericho. There were probably some other people that were, that were more well respected in Jericho than Rahab. But Rahab takes these two spies in and protects them and helps to preserve their lives. Asks for a small favor. She just says, hey, can you, you know, do you think because of the kindness I've shown you when, when you come back to take this city and God's going to give it to you, we've been waiting 40 years for you to come. Do, do you think you could spare my family? That, that's kind of reasonable to ask. And it's not really much to ask. Will, will you spare my family? Yeah, we, we will do that. And you hang this scarlet cord from the window and anybody that's in this house, when we come back, they'll, they'll be preserved. If you read in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew chapter 1. It's one of those, it's one of those chapters that if you just kind of are reading it from a natural perspective, it's one of those boring chapters. And so and so begat so and so and begat so and so begat so and so. And what's interesting about that genealogy is the the majority of the people in that genealogy are the, the, the men. But there's four ladies that are referenced in that chapter. And, and basically what's interesting about all four of those ladies is everyone had some serious strikes against them. The four that are the four ladies that are mentioned are not the not the virtuous women of Proverbs thirty one. They're not the wonderful wives, godly, holy women, exemplary lives. The four women that are mentioned all have some kind of major issue, and one of those is this lady by the name of Rahab who had no idea, she just thought she was helping a couple of spies. She, she just thought she was doing a favor to a few spies from Israel, not realizing that there was a potential to become something much greater. To actually become a part of the genealogy that brought about the Messiah. One of those other ones is... She's got a book named after her, and that's, that's Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. She was, she was not a Jew. She was a Gentile. And, and, and it was really through some adverse circumstances that, that she gets brought into the, to the story of Jesus. Of Jesus' genealogy. Because of her, mother, her mother-in-law, Naomi. She decides wherever you go, I'm going. Whatever, 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 whoever your God is, that's going to be my God. And, 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 and long story short, if you're not familiar with it, Naomi and her family had left Bethlehem and went to Moab because of a family. Her husband, her two sons die. They had married, daughter, they had married wives in Moab. And now, now Naomi decides she's going back to Bethlehem. And what's interesting is as, as they go back to Bethlehem and people begin to see Naomi and they begin to call out, hey, there, there, there's Naomi, here comes Naomi. And Naomi responds and says, don't call me Naomi anymore. She says, call me Mara because God has dealt with me bitterly. She says, I went out full. Oh, Jesus. I went out with my husband and my sons. I was full. But I've come back empty. Oh, Naomi. 
Your perspective on where you are and what's happened in your life is that God has dealt with you bitterly. But the end of the story is God was doing anything but dealing with you bitterly. God was setting you up so that you as well would become a part of the genealogy of Jesus because it's only a generation or two later that Naomi is now the grandmother or the great-grandmother of a man by the name of Jesse who then becomes the dad of a man by the name of David who then becomes that shepherd boy who becomes the greatest king in the history of Israel. I I, I know where you are right now may not seem like much. I, I know what you've gone through may seem to have disqualified you from a hope for your future. I, I know the mistakes that you've made seem to make it that you should just give up on the rest of your life. But I, I believe there's some Naomi's in this place this morning that it may seem like God has dealt with you bitterly, but actually God has just been setting you up because of the potential of what it is He has for you to become. Oh, Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I, I, I could go on and on and on. I, I could keep going throughout Scripture, but, but let, me, let, me just, let me just, as I wind down, let me just, let's bring it a little bit closer to home. How, how, about, a, how about a young, I think, early 20s, or early 20s if I'm not mistaken, a, a, a young British guy that decides that he's going to come to America for, for holiday, vacation. Just coming to America, just just on holiday. Sister Mott, he was early 20s, right? Yeah. Gets involved in construction. Ends up building one of the most successful construction companies in our area. Just a, just a young man, just no big expectations. And now, he didn't start it, but pastoring a thriving church in, in Liverpool has, has met the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, sat in rooms with high officials of Israel, and countless other things that God has done through the life of Brother John Hemus, who knew that 30 plus years ago when he walked into that old sanctuary, Brother Lewis, who, who knew? Who knew what the potential to become was? How about a guy born and raised, I think, in Indiana? Becomes an electrician. Working at shipyards in Virginia Beach, I believe. Chesapeake, Norfolk, somewhere down there. Starts coming up every now and then to play some sports. I don't know, we've all gotten old and frail. We got to have our Sunday afternoon nap. These guys, Brother Krieger, I'm assuming you're probably in that group. These guys go out on Sundays and play football touch football for a couple hours on Sunday afternoon and then go to church that night. There's just such a heaviness that just settled in here. Whoa. My, uh, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I got 20 minutes till your cars turn back into pumpkins, so I, I'm all right. A couple of, couple of a little while ago now, we, we, were, we were at lunch, Mission Barbecue, imagine that. And it's, you know, most Sundays, it's turkey, green beans, whatever the dressing of the, uh, not dress, dessert of the season is, and sweet tea. Depending on what the black plate special is, if you, if you don't know this language I'm speaking, you need to... Whatever the black plate special is, sometimes I'll trade out the turkey. And, and my 
21-year-old, skinny <laughs> son talks about how little he eats for lunch on Sunday because ooh, I don't want to feel whatever for church at night. You ever know, you ever realize sometimes what people might be saying, but they're not really saying? I mean, I'm kind of thinking, if anybody at this table is the one that ought to be eating a little piece of salmon and drinking water so they're not too overweight for church tonight, it probably shouldn't be the 21-year-old. It probably ought to be the 52-year-old. Give me another dessert. Check the box. Where in the world was I going with that? <laughs> yeah, but why Mission Barbecue? I don't know either. Sunday afternoons. There we go. Sunday afternoons. I need my nap because of my obese eating. <laughs> he'd, he'd stick around. He wouldn't come to church. Couldn't get him to church, but he'd stick around and play football for a couple hours and then drive his wife, who had already gotten the Holy Ghost, back down in time to be able to be at work on Monday. Finally, one night comes to a service, evangelist Keith Clark was preaching. Who would have thought that that electrician that was only willing to stick around to play a little bit of football every now and then but not go to church, who would have thought he would have spent 30 years impacting nations in Africa that only heaven, only heaven knows the ultimate impact. How about a couple of 20-something-year-olds, I believe, early 20s, that a milkman delivering milk, I don't even really remember those days, but door gets knocked on by past our Bishop Wright, invited to church. Two people that at that point in time would have been classified, considered hippies basically, unchurched, walk into a first service. At the end of that first service, they come to the altar, lift their hands, and in just a matter of moments, they begin to speak in other tongues, baptize with the Holy Ghost, get baptized in Jesus' name. Who, who would have ever thought those two people would pastor what is the, the largest UPC church in Maryland, CLC, what was Gaithersburg, now Imesville? Who would have thought that that guy would have preached all over the world? Who would have thought Brother Libby and Sister Libby would have? I'm still confused even after her passing because I keep hearing two different numbers. I think the last one I heard was 14, so I'll just go with that for now. But who would have thought that a 14-year-old girl sitting on the porch with her mom living in poverty and didn't get invited to church but actually asked for an invitation to church, who would have thought that that 14-year-old girl would be responsible for a church that was started in the 1950s and still is going and thriving in Mississippi, and who would have thought that she would end up with multiple preachers as a daughter, as grandsons, and my grandmother, if you're not aware. I realize that I, you know, you, you probably should expect from me what I am, what I do. I get that. I have a great-grandfather that was a preacher. All four of my grandparents were licensed ministers. Both of my parents are ordained ministers. Okay. Who would have thought that... Someone raised in a 
broken home, experiencing a lot of crazy things in early childhood, losing a mother at 15, who would have thought that that would be the most amazing wife and mother in the world and the most awesome worship leader in the world? Who would have, who would have thought? The potential of what you can become in God has nothing to do with where you are. Has nothing to do with the family you've come from. Has nothing to do with the mistakes you've made. Has nothing to do with what's been done to you. It really boils down to one simple thing. Jesus is saying, follow me, and I will make you to become. You you don't have to make it happen. You don't have to, you don't have to produce it. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God. It is God which worketh in you. Both to will and to do of His good pleasure. No, you, you, you may not be sent to Africa. You may not go pastor a church. You, you may not, you, your story may not be some of these others I've mentioned. But there's some, other, there's some other people that if I, you know, I could tell you their story. Either present day or, 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 uh. Other examples in Scripture that no, maybe maybe what happened through them, what they became, maybe it didn't seem quite as significant, but yet the eternal impact. I I know I know it's I know Jesus is the focal point of the story. I I know that, but but if there had not been a Joseph. The story couldn't have gone quite the way it was because the Bible says of Jesus that He fulfilled all righteousness. And there were some things that had to be done in Jesus' life before He could do them for, them, for Himself, that he, he needed somebody else. So, so maybe you may not be the Apostle Paul. Uh, I mean, that, that was another one I was thinking about this morning. Here's the guy that is uh, the persecutor of the church. He's standing there while Stephen is being stoned to death. And, and, and basically, if you read some of the other translations, essentially what it's saying is that, that Saul, who became Paul, Saul is standing there and endorsing Stephen being killed. And then he becomes the greatest apostle. A bunch of them tend to sit over here, so I'm not leaving you out if you're out there, but these last couple of months or so, especially, maybe longer than that, but these last couple of months or so, there's, there's, there's a number of you young adults sitting over here that you're new to us as a church. God didn't just bring you here to find a group of nice people, and have a nice church to go to. <laughs> and I tell you that what I'm preaching this morning, if it's for anybody, it's for you. You, you. you probably have determined what God is capable of doing in your future. Yeah, probably. That's probably somewhere down here. <laughs> yeah. God's just saying, Kevin, you have the potential to become. You, you have the potential to become. I, 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 just, I just referenced some young adults, and so I know there's some older folks here. And but you know what? I, I, how many of you, I, 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 ladies, I, you're excused. You don't have to respond. I don't, I don't want to be on your bad side. So men only. How many of you here are 75 or older? How many men are 75 or older? 
One. One man. Two. There we go. Two. There's probably a couple ladies in there, but we don't want to. <laughs> we don't want the headlines to be dead preacher. <laughs> Murdered by 75 plus year old woman. <sighs> I know Brother Mallory can take it, so um, can, can you imagine that that just now, at 70, I mean, you've lived a lot of life. Had a, you've had, you've retired three or four times now. <laughs> Six. <laughs> he's, he's, he's got more lives than a cat. He's still going. And he's been at roughly, roughly how many years have you led a small group at Antioch? Since about the early 90s. So 10, 15 years. <laughs> Some of you all like. That's about 30 years. <laughs> Been a lot of lives that you've impacted. Did you guys win the jewelry? Or are you opposite? They won. Other lives together. Your sister. Son sitting here through Sister Mallory. Can you imagine what if God just just showed up to you today? <laughs> Nothing in it, but, but Sister Mallory, I got I got a future for you. <laughs> you know, God, you could have. <laughs> I love hanging around with some of these thirty-something-year-olds. They make me feel so. I won't call any names. I'll be nice and not call any names. But one of them yesterday at at James's party. Early 30s. Oh, man. Of course, I know. I know there's some of you 75-year-olds that wag your head at me. I get that. But okay. Oh, man. I'm, I gotta, I, I'm starting to have to sleep sitting up because I got acid reflux. And I'm, <laughs> um, so I need to go get my nap. I'm like, man, I'm feeling better all the time. Keep talking. In fact, I, I've said this, I've said this a few times. I really would love, I mean, my flesh would love for us to be at this real emotional moment. But we're not really there, but that's okay. I, I've I said it just yesterday again in the in the minister's training class. I've said it other times recently. You, you understand that if you 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 look at the lives of some of the most notable characters in the Bible, some of you Actually, let me rephrase that. Most of us are not anywhere near close to when God began to do the significant things through their lives. Wasn't a 20-something or 30-something year old, Brother Rondell, that God used to lead a nation out of bondage. It was an 80-year-old man. An 80-year-old man that God says, you are going to lead millions of people out of 400 plus years of bondage. The devil's got some folks here that are in the mid to later part of life convinced that you're just hanging on to the end. But I believe I can tell somebody here in the Holy Ghost today, some of you, the most significant things that God has planned and purposed for your life, I don't care what He's already done, some of the most significant things have yet to happen. You may be in your 60s, 70s, 80s, so be it. But God has some things that He has been developing in you because there has been a potential for you to become. I want you to stand, and when you stand, if you would, would you bow your head, close your eyes? I, 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 I've, I felt this, I felt this message last night. Some of you are probably thinking, well, that's kind of late, isn't it? No, it was, it was early. Usually, it's this morning. 
And I felt this strongly last night. And again, I, I really, if it's just one person, I'm okay with that. If this whole message is for just one person, that's okay. But I, I'm pretty confident it's not just one. So I, I believe there's some people here this morning that maybe it's, it's the first time or you're still in the beginning stages of, of you've got that invitation that says, follow me. And, and, and you've already kind of started I do believe there may be somebody here this morning, you've, you've, you've never responded to that, follow me. You're still trying to figure out if you're going to do your life your way and try to fulfill your dreams and your goals, your ambitions. I, you, you may succeed, but it's not a guarantee. You may be part of the 10% that end up in the NFL, M MLB, NBA. You, you may be in that small percentage you may you may happen to be lucky or not there's no guarantee of that you may become the CEO of some fortune 500 company and so be it but there's no guarantee but oh my friend there is a guarantee this morning that if you respond to the invitation that says follow me there is a guarantee that there are going to be some very significant things that God will do through your life if you will just fully commit to following Him. When, when Jesus said that to Peter and James and John and Andrew, they didn't say, can we talk about this? Can, can we negotiate this? Can, can you tell me a little bit more what I'm going to get out of it? The Bible says that they just immediately followed. Don't sit there right now and rationalize, God, what, what am I going to get out of this? What will you do out of this? Would you just let there be a response like there was with those disciples and says, Lord, if you're inviting me to become, it's bigger than what I think is possible. It's bigger than what I ever imagined, but I'm going to follow you. I also preach to some people this morning, you, you, you've already made that commitment, but it's not something to be made just once, that there's times throughout our lives we've got to recommit again. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to let you make me whatever it is you want me to become. Come on, there's some that have already led the way this morning. Come on, there's some that's already stepped out into the waters. But there's some more of you that I believe the Holy Ghost is talking to this morning. Don't, don't limit your future. Don't limit what God has for you based on where you are, based on what you see, based on what you feel. There is within you the potential to become something in the kingdom of eternal value and significance. Bigger, greater, beyond what you've ever thought possible. God, it's your spirit that works in us to produce it. It's not my ability, it's not my strength, it's not my talent. Your spirit works in me. Oh, have your way right now, Jesus. If you don't feel the need to respond for yourself right now, would you would you be a conduit for the Spirit of the Lord to use? Come on, if, if you need to respond, please do that. But if you don't need to respond, let the Lord use you to minister to somebody else. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on, I believe the Holy Ghost is doing something in some hearts and lives right now. Come on, you don't have to settle for a future based on what you I'll think just yes. seems reasonable. You don't have to settle for a future based on what the odds are. You've got the potential to become something of value and significance in the kingdom of God. That's what I'll be. 
whatever you've called me to be. God, I believe what you've called me to be is bigger than what I think I can be. It's greater than what I think is possible. But it's not me that has to produce it. It's not me that has to make it happen. My responsibility is to say yes and follow. That's what I'll be. My responsibility is to say yes and then follow. Oh, I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. I say yes, Lord. 